Your words, not mine. Newspaper reports on the miners' strike, 1984. The 6th of March, 1984, the beginning of a dark year in British history. This is a headline from the Newcastle Journal, the 22nd of September, 1984. It did not ask what it saved or what it meant, but what it took away. The 1984 miners' strike is regarded as one of the bitterest industrial disputes ever seen in British history. Five deaths occurred in relation to it, as well as 123 injuries and nearly 12,000 arrests. Violence between miners and police characterised the strike, as well as the fear of losing their jobs and the poverty this unemployment brought with it. Picketing was also very commonplace, where miners and their communities would form a line to prevent those trying to break the strike from getting back into the workplace. These were strike breakers, also called scabs, who decided to return to work, each with varying reasons. The industrial action was called to prevent the decline of the coal industry that had started from 1952. Depletion of sources, mechanisation and cheaper imports led to over 1,200 be pits being shut down from 1952 until 1984. When a further 20 pit closures were announced on the 6th of March, the National Union of Miners, the NUM, which had been formed in 1945, began to strike. Not a week later, over 180,000 people were protesting all over the country. Even non-industrial areas were protesting in solidarity with the miners. This image, with obvious far-left connotations, was taken in London, 1984. Here we enter two of the most controversial figures of British history, Arthur Scargill and Margaret Thatcher. As president of the NUM from 1982, Arthur Scargill was the one responsible for beginning the strike. Some see this action as a defence of British coal and of the working class. Others see it as an act of tyranny, as the vote was illegal since it had, was not voted upon in a national ballot. Equally, Thatcher, the Conservative Prime Minister from 1979 to 1990, is seen by some as betraying British industry and leading to the collapse of communities dependent upon it. Others view her as doing the necessary thing to help the economy recover and reduce the power trade unions had over the country. Whether hated or admired, you have to admit Margaret Thatcher has come to be one of history's most contested and controversial Prime Ministers. The media of the time has come under scrutiny since the strike occurred. Many accuse it of being heavily biased against the miners, especially against Scargill. On the 12th of March, for example, the Newcastle Journal called it action by the back door and the Scargill was spl splitting the miners by not calling a national ballot. The same day, the Liverpool Echo ironically echoed this, calling the strike a rejection of democracy. The Newcastle Evening Chronicle continually posted letters only from readers who thought the strike was unlawful. More national newspapers took a similar anti scargill approach, with the state personally blaming Scargill for the strike and its negative impact. The headline ran in September saying Scargill's men kill sick child's concert, in which they directly attribute the strikers to Scargill and use sensationalist language like kill. Even though the strike did cause the concert to be cancelled, it is the personal blame on Scargill that is important here. The Illustrated London News ran an article that compared him to Hitler for his incitement to hatred and violent action. Equally, this same newspaper also regularly showed support for Thatcher during the strike. One article stated it was no good simply blaming Mrs Thatcher for the situation. Another complimented her de determination in these trying times, arguing that Scargill would not be won over by reasonableness and that her attitude of complete defeat for either her or him was the only way a Prime Minister could act. On the other hand, however, not all the media was purely anti scargill the Newcastle Evening Chronicle, despite publishing letters decrying the illegal nature of the strike, also ran articles denouncing Thatcher. One rather scathing letter labelled her a dictator and claimed she was waging an undeclared war on the miners. Other newspapers, mainly those with socialist or labour connections, publicly black backed the miners. The Newsline, a Trotskyist newspaper, claimed in March that the miners' pickets 
had been infiltrated with bogus picketers in order to instigate violence and blame it on the strikers. Although openly socialist, these were some of the rare newspapers that reported government involvement in picketing. What is striking about this coverage is that despite being in the minority with their reporting, the newsline was seemingly absolutely correct. There were agent provocateurs amongst the miners. 30 years later, documents were released that confirmed that agents from MI5, the police special branch, GCHQ and the NSA had infiltrated the NUM in order to spy on them and generally attempted to break them up from the inside. It was also revealed that the government was preparing to send in troops against the protesters, which was nigh to a Second World War, a Second Civil War. Some miners recollect that agents were present at the picket lines to throw missiles at the police, so the police seemingly had a reason to charge them. Similarly, some also recollect that they witnessed soldiers amongst the police lines. Whilst it is likely that there were agents amongst the picketers given the level of government espionage and involvement, both of these claims are based on anecdotes and have no concrete evidence behind them. We must therefore remain vigilant against believing stories simply because of who said them. However, there is no denying the level of betrayal and anger towards the police from these communities. One of the biggest causes of anger at the media, however, was that most newspapers negated the harshness of police in the clashes, or even opted to shift the blame onto the miners. The Liverpool Echo reported in September, after a violent clash at the Maltby Colliery, that police were attacked with air guns, catapults, and even the glass coverings of cat eyes from the road. They failed to mention that the police committed unwarranted attacks in this clash, too. MP Kevin Barron, who was present to try and mediate the picketing, told his story of being hospitalised by a group of policemen on the way back to his car, despite not provoking them. One of the most violent clashes in British industrial protest occurred on the 18th of June at a coking plant in Orgreave. The NUM deployed 5,000 picketers to prevent strike breakers entering the works. The Times recorded that the police were at first attacked by a hail of missiles including bricks until they pushed the picketers back behind barricades. What they failed to report upon was that the police instigated the attack by mounting a charge against the NUM when they attempted to stop the strike breakers from entering. The Sun consistently depicted the picketing as a war, even referring to it as the pit war, calling the picketers rampaging armies and referring to Scargill as General Scargill. Not only does this depict the miners as the violent ones, but it also depicts the picket lines as scenes of absolute warfare. Yet the Sheffield Police Watch, after visiting over 200 picket lines, described them as generally peaceful. The violence that did occur, however, they generally attributed it to over-policing rather than the picketers. Whilst it must be remembered that not all the police were against the miners, as Thatcher was revealed later on to have been willing to use troops should the police have failed or turned, the newspapers certainly seemed against them. Perhaps they did not want to cross the law enforcers or not want to back what could be considered unlawful. No matter their reasoning, the miners' strike of 1984 was a dark time for the miners, their families and pretty much everyone in Britain, both dark in terms of how much people lost, but also generally because of the problems that lack of coal brought. They lost faith in their media too, their government, and a considerable amount lost faith in their police force and even their local friends and people. Communities lost a source of income, families lost relatives, and lots lost jobs. Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead got to number one in the charts when Margaret Thatcher died in 2013. That resentment for her never seemed to leave the mining communities. It probably never will. <laughs>